Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, if you want to find where you're going to be sitting, but also stand up wherever you are. So find your seat, then stand. We'll get started here. Good to see everybody today. Good to see everyone. You know, I can't see you on the live stream, but I'm glad you're here. All right. One second here. Well, I feel good, good, good. Well, I feel good. Oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Well, I can love, love, love. Well, I can love. Oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me love good, 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 good. Well, I've got joy, joy, joy. Well, I've got joy down in my soul. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that gives me such joy, 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 joy. Well, I can sing. Sing, sing, well I can sing, oh yes my Lord, because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me sing good, 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 well I can serve, 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 well I can serve, oh yes my Lord, because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me so good, 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 good. Do you feel good, good, good? Do you feel good? Then clap your hands because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Do you feel good? Good, good, do you feel good? Then clap your hands because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Good job, guys. Good to have a seat. Good morning, church. So um, bear with me. I'll have to be reading from these announcements. I didn't really review them that well. but So we have three announcements. So the first announcement is, as a leadership, we are trying to determine who's engaged each week in the service, both here in the building and online on our live stream. Um, uh, well, we can see your faces here in person. It's a little hard to do that online, so if you would please uh, help us out tremendously. If you would comment, like, or share our streams, that would, that would help us out greatly, and we'd appreciate that. Um, as always, you can, uh, you can text any prayer request, um, praise or thanksgiving, at the end of, that will be prayed over at the end of the service. Today, you can text Dustin King. His number is 814-602-1340. Um, if you have anything going on throughout the week that you would uh, like us to pray over, uh, or you, anything that you'd like our leadership, uh, we would, they would love to make themselves available for you. So please don't hesitate to text him. Um, if you're given this morning, we have a few options. You can give online by going to alliancecfc.com slash give. You can drop off your offering in the box in the fellowship hall uh, if you're here in person, or you can mail it in to the, your offerings to the building or to Charlie's house. Um, we, sh we, sever we sincerely thank you for your willingness to give in any way. And so um, my welcome today uh, is, is centered around freedom in Christ. Um, to, in the land of the free, I think we tend to confuse what freedom in Christ means. I think many of us have an external view of freedom in that it's our personal independence or our abilities to make our own decisions or to choose our own path in life. But is this really what Jesus promised us? 
When he revealed himself as the, Messiah, as the Messiah, he said that he had come to earth to proclaim freedom. And in another occasion, he said that if the Son sets you free, you will be set free indeed. Jesus was not sent to set us free to do whatever we want. Uh, he was freeing us to do what we ought to do, Liber liberating us to walk with God. Um, this is our spiritual freedom, our ability, our ability to obey God and to choose his will for us to live. It's this freedom that sin has, no, that sin has denied us. So um, if you will join me in prayer and we can uh, definitely start the service. Dear God, we are so thankful to be free to worship you. We are thankful that we are able to come together in this building or to gather online. We pray that you're with us as we go through this service. We pray that Dustin is... Uh, Choose that Dustin's words flow through you in today's sermon. We are so thankful for everything you've done in our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I don't think we have any kids here today. Um, however, I still prepared a lesson, so I want to do it. Okay, we're going to do it. Do it, man. Got to get my props. We got kids out there. All right. Lane, right? We got some kids online. So here's what we're going to do. Today, I want to talk about our world. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is the earth. It's kind of small. You see, we live on this, and it's from our vantage point, it's really big, right? We can't see all of it at one time. But if you look at the earth from space then you can see it's just this, this little kind of blue ball with, uh, with all of the countries where we live, all the plants and the animals and the mountains and, and all those things. Our Earth is so amazing. But compared to other planets, it can also seem kind of small, right? So if you look in, in some pictures of space, you might see Jupiter. This is not what Jupiter actually looks like. It doesn't have a, a barcode on it, okay? Uh, but Jupiter is about 11 times bigger than Earth. This is not to scale. But you can see that compared to the Earth, like, or, uh, yeah, Jupiter is, is pretty big. You know, our world seems really big, but there are bigger things in, in this galaxy than us. And then if you think of the sun, the sun is 109 times bigger than the Earth, which means... Uh, across, if I'm doing a comparison here, the sun is like the length of this stage. So it's from here to here. That's about the, the, the length of the sun compared to the earth. And so what's, what's the point? What, what, what point am I making here? This universe is so big and so beautiful and so awesome, yet you can't find life anywhere else in this galaxy or in this universe, so far they haven't found life anywhere else except for where we live, except for on Earth. Why would God do that? Why would he make such a big, beautiful universe but only create life on Earth? Because he loves us. Because he wants to be with us. He made us special. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God says that uh, he, he saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. He looked at us. He looked at the things that he had made. He looked at his whole earth. And he loved it. He loved us. And so let's sing about God's love for us today. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little planet and all the people that are on it. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the people of the world. Jesus came to save the children, all the children of the world. 
Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus came to save the children of the world. All right, guys, you're going to have to stand up for this one, okay? If we're thinking about creation and how God made everything, he also made hippopotamuses. All right. In the beginning, God made the seas and the forests filled with trees. He made the mountains up so high, and at the top he placed the skies. His fingerprints are everywhere, just to show how much he cares. And in the middle he had lots of fun, he made a hippo that weighs a ton. Hip, 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 hippopotamus, hip, hip, hooray, God made all of us. Hip, 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 hippopotamus. Hip, hip, hooray, God made all of us. Good job, guys. All right, kids, just remember that God made all of us because he loves us and wants to be with us. He loves you. He loves me. He loves your neighbor. He loves the person that's mean to you. He wants us all to be uh, together with him because he loves us. Let's keep worshiping together. There we go. Okay. For this, uh, I know we just did a very uh, exerting exercise. So you can sit if you want to, or you can stand however you feel like you want to worship. Okay. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me, Lord, and I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me, Lord, and I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days. And step by step, you'll lead me, Lord. And I will follow you all of my days. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, 
job guys give me the heart of a servant tender and faithful and true fill me with love and use me oh lord so that the world can see you give me the heart Have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Did it. All right. Let's try that again. Wow. Good morning, everybody morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. How many of you guys have off tomorrow? Yeah? How many of you guys are going to get to enjoy uh, some time with family tomorrow or maybe just just no work, right? Just I get to relax. There's a reason why we get to do that. There's a reason why we celebrate this weekend and that's because there are so many men and women that lost their lives protecting us, serving which is what we're gonna talk about this morning. And so, as we prepare to lean into this lesson, we wanna remember that. Another thing that we wanna remember, uh, wanna remind you about uh, before we dive into this lesson, uh, Sam Driver is gonna be leading a group starting this coming Tuesday, June 1st, okay? This coming Tuesday, June 1st, we're gonna be meeting here at the building at 7 p.m. June 1st, Tuesday, 7 p.m. here at the building. Everybody got that? All Tuesdays in June, there are five of them. So if you are interested in that, come be a part of that. The topic for that is going to be Jesus-style discipleship, Jesus-style disciple-making. Okay? So if you're free on Tuesdays at 7, be here. Okay? Everybody get that? There were some questions this morning as people were walking in. Yes, we are mask optional now. So if you don't want to wear this, you are not required to anymore. We're not going to ask you about it. We're not going to police it. We're not going to do anything like that. If you don't want to wear masks, then, then that is your ability now. Cool. Nailed it. All right. So with that being said, uh, let's bow in a word of prayer as we prepare for the lesson this morning. Father God, we just want to tell you we love you. God, I'm thankful for the opportunity that we have um, 
as your children gathered here, both in person and online, to worship you, to give you thanks, to give you praise, to give you honor and glory. God, that are only due to you because you are a good God. God, this morning, uh, we're mindful of uh, what this weekend represents for those of us in this nation who, um, who get to live free, as Corey mentioned earlier. And God, for, for us as Americans, we live free because we know that there are many who gave their lives so that we could have that freedom. God, we want to remember those now, whether they're people we know or people we don't. And we want to thank you for their service. We want to thank you for their sacrifice. Because, God, it's, it's a sacrifice and a service like that that we remember every week when we gather. God, the service and sacrifice of those men and women remind us in, in a very small way, of the service and sacrifice that, that Jesus exemplified for us on the cross. God, today as we talk about what service looks like for a disciple, I pray that you would move me out of the way. God, I pray that I would be filled with your spirit. I pray that your spirit would fill this place. God, that ears and hearts and minds would be open to receive that message. God, that you would give us ears to hear so that we might understand. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God, so much for the hope that we have in him. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we've been working through this series titled Fishers of Men. And over the last few weeks, what we've done is we've started to make the transition from talking about what the mission of the church is, which is to make disciples who make disciples, right? Okay, good. Everybody was paying attention. That's good. We talked about what a disciple looks like based on Jim Putman's definition in real life discipleship. Give him a shout out so that I'm citing my sources. Okay. We talked about the fact that there is a three-part definition for what a disciple is. There is, there, does anyone know what the three parts are? Head, heart, hands. Okay, that we would make a conscious decision with our head to follow Jesus and to make him Lord, to make him the authority, to make him the head, right? Cool how that works out. That we would allow him to change our hearts, that we might be transformed from the inside out, and then that we would be committed to his mission, which is to go and make disciples with our hands. And then two weeks ago, what we did was we started working through these five discipleship commitments that we have here at Alliance. And those discipleship commitments are to grow in intimacy with God, to mature spiritually, to maximize relationally, serve strategically, and live missionally. A couple weeks ago, I covered the first two of these, that we might grow in intimacy with God and mature spiritually. Last week, Sam did an awesome job of talking about maximizing relationally and what that looks like and why it's so important for us to do that in light of the prayer that Jesus offers in the garden. He prays that we may be one as he and the Father are one. Why are relationships so important? Because they reflect the relationship that the Son has with the Father. And even more so than that, we see that the relationship that we share that reflects the relationship of the Father and the Son demonstrates and shows to the world that God loves us and that he sent his son for us. Amen? So today what we're going to look at is service. This idea of serving strategically. And so I have a question to kind of get us started here. My question is this, why is service so important? Why is service so important? Why do we talk about service as much as we do? Why is it one of our commitments? Why is it something that we as disciples need to be committed to? 
I have an answer. <laughs> but I, I get that answer from something that Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, that's where we're going to concentrate our time this morning. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And it's here in this text that I feel like Paul outlines for us, as Christians, as disciples, why service is so important, why service is so vital. And he starts in verse 1 by saying this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Powerful text. Powerful text. So what I want to do specifically is I want to look at those underlying phrases. We see in this passage that Paul uses these three phrases here, okay? The first phrase that Paul uses is that we would be of the same mind. We see that in verse two. And then he says that we would be of one mind, also in verse two. And then in verse five, as he's making a transition to another part of the text, he says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. Three times, Paul uses similar language here in this text. You might ask, why does Paul use similar language three times in this text? I think it's because he's trying to get us to understand something. But the question is, what, what specifically is he talking about here? What is Paul trying to convey? What is Paul trying to get across to us by pointing out multiple times in this text that we should have the same mind, that we should be of one mind, that we should have this mind. What is he talking about? Let's look at verses 3 and 4. Because in verse 2, he says twice that we should have the same mind, that we should have one mind. And then in verse 5, he mentions it again. So what does he sandwich it with? Let, let's look at this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Okay? But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. All right? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay? So, Go ahead, Corey, yeah. So what mind do we as disciples of Jesus, do we as disciples of Jesus need to have? This is what Paul points out. First and foremost, we need to be selfless. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. Now, ambition is not necessarily wrong, right? Ambition, especially if it's for the sake of the mission of Christ, ambition is a great thing that we would be fully devoted, committed, that we would be willfully and, and like strongly pursuing something. That's a good thing. But he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Which implies, like, don't just so willfully and, and strongly pursue 
what you want. Does that hit home for anybody? He says, don't be conceited. The idea here behind conceit is that it's an excessively favorable, sorry, let me start over, an excessively favorable, why is that word so difficult? Opinion of one's own ability, importance, and wit. I'm favorable of my own opinion. We need to be humble. We need to be humble. Which, in light of being humble, it means that I'm lowering myself. We've talked about this a lot. I've mentioned this before, but C.S. Lewis talks about the fact that humility is not uh, thinking less of myself, it's thinking of myself less. Do we all understand that? Like, the, humility is not like that I'm tearing myself down and I'm feeling horrible about myself. That's not the idea behind humility. But the idea behind humility is that I would lower myself in order that I might raise another up. Leading into the fact that I might see others as more significant than myself. I believe, church, that when Paul says we need to have this mind, that we need to have one mind, that we need to be of the same mind, these are the things that he's talking about. And yet, these are the things that the world hates. These are the things that in our flesh we kick against. I don't like thinking about other people. I don't like thinking about the wants or needs of another person. I would much rather think of what I want. Why? Because it's better. I would much rather think of what I desire because it gets me what I want. But if I have to think about what you want and what you desire, that means I have to make a sacrifice and I don't like that. It goes against my very nature in the flesh. I like thinking very highly of myself. I would rather elevate myself than lower myself. I don't like the idea of being humble. I don't like the idea of seeing someone as more significant than me. Why does Paul need to give this reminder to the church in Philippi? Because in our flesh, these are the very things that we kick against. And when we think about service specifically, it'll be very difficult for me to lean into any kind of service if I don't have these things in my mind. If I don't pattern my behavior after these things. Or, or, I might serve, but in the process of me serving, I'm only going to be thinking about me and not you. It's like what Jesus mentions with the Pharisees that are praying in public and they're praying loudly and they're praying with big words. They're doing it for what reason, church? To be seen. Is that selfless? No, it's selfish. Or when he addresses the Pharisees giving, they make sure that everybody's watching, right? Why? Because they want to be seen. It's selfish. Maybe it's not that we don't like serving. Maybe it's that we do like serving, but we only serve because we want to be seen doing it. Which, again, goes against all of these things. And so when he says, have this mind, what mind do we as disciples need to have? We need to be selfless. We need to not be conceited. We need to be humble. We need to see others as more significant than ourselves. Do we get this? Before I move on, I want everyone to say, yeah, I get this. Nod your head. 
We see this clearly in the text. Dustin's not making anything up. This is what Paul is addressing here in Philippians 2. Everybody get it? Cool. Let's move on. I want to read now verses 5 through 8. Because Paul is going to make a transition here in the text. From going to talk about, like, this is what I want you guys to be about. This is what I want you guys to think about. This is the mindset that I want you guys to have. He says, have this mind among yourselves. Read the underlying part of this. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let's try that again. That was a little, that was a little jumbled. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What do you think he means there? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What do you think he's getting at? Have this mindset. Have this focus. It's a focus that also belonged to whom? It's a mindset that also belonged to whom? Jesus. Jesus was selfless. Jesus was not conceited. Jesus was humble. Jesus saw others as more significant than himself. And so he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of of what church? A servant. You see, when we talk about service in contexts like this, we often go to John 13, which is a great example because we see in a moment Jesus takes an opportunity to teach his disciples about service. And not just his audio learners, but his visual learners. Where he grabs a towel, he grabs a basin full of water, and he goes around the table at dinner, at Passover, and he starts to wash his disciples' feet. He says, I've set an example for you that you would do for one another what I have done for you. It's this beautiful moment. Or or we come to these moments and we talk about Mark 10. Where in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. serve." Right? Great text. But here we see the underlying part of all of that. We don't just see the actions of Jesus. We see the mindset of Jesus. The mindset that drives the actions and the mindset of Christ is that he looked at you and saw you as more significant than himself. What the God of the universe, the Son of God, who had glory and splendor and majesty in heaven, lowers himself. Lowers himself. Comes down from glory. Comes down from majesty. And it's not just that he lowers himself to a place of royalty here on earth. No. No, he went lower than that. He lowered himself to the place where Nobody else would want to go. He hung out with people that the religious people didn't want to hang out with. He touched the people that the religious people didn't want to go anywhere near. Do we get this? Like, the people that the Pharisees would turn their noses up at, Jesus spent most of his time with those people. He 
he lowered himself to the lowest possible place. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself of all status, of all position. And instead of being the king of glory, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this mindset where I'm going to be so focused on them and not focused on me. And you know where that led him, church? Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Why? Because that was the ultimate example, the ultimate measure of, I'm going to put you above me. To the point where the king of glory, who was once seated on his throne, is now crucified. And so I wonder if this is the example that Jesus sets, not just in practice, but in mindset, and this influences Jesus' entire ministry. He comes to flip it all upside down. We see in that Mark 10 passage where the disciples are, their disciples are squabbling. They're fighting over who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus goes, you guys, like... You don't get it. You know, you see how the world handles things. You see how the world, like, fights for position above each other. He goes, it's not going to be that way with you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And he sets an example for them in different moments where he serves people He feeds people, he heals people, he sits with people, he talks with people. And we're like, ah, those are awesome examples of what this looks like. But it goes further than that. Because Jesus doesn't just set the example in easier behavior. We see here that Paul says that took him to a cross. To the point where Jesus wasn't just willing to give up time and energy and money or whatever. Jesus was willing to literally give up his life for the sake of another. And so, I want to wrap up here. When we put ourselves into the mindset of Christ and follow his example, we come to one logical conclusion. What's that logical conclusion, church? I want you to say that louder. It's not about me. It's not about me. We could say this about any part of life when it comes to being a disciple. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It is. But it's also about the other. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the other commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is, in, this is in the greatest command. The mindset that we are to have as disciples of Jesus is that it's not about me. And I, I've been reading a lot about discipleship, and one of the things that some of these authors will point to is that you have people that will come into the church And they'll behave as consumers. Where they'll they'll come into the building and they'll say, you know, what does this church have to offer me? How is this church going to serve me? And to some extent, to some extent, I get that. Like if you're a parent who has young kids, I would hope that a church with a strong children's ministry would be on your mind. Right? Right? Like, to an extent, I get that. I would hope that there are certain things that you're thinking about, like, man, I need a place that's going to support me and encourage me. Right? 
Like, that's a good thing. But if my mindset is not also, how am I going to serve this church? Like, there's a difference between the consumer and the committed disciple. There's a difference in mindset between the consumer and the partner for the gospel. The partner for the gospel can walk into any scenario and have the mindset that it's not about me. I can walk into any moment and go, how can I lay down my life for you right now? And I get it, that could be exhausting. Because it might demand your time. It could be financially frustrating because it might demand your money when you feel like you have none. It might demand your energy. For Jesus, it demanded his life. And so how do we get from point A to point B where, as a mature disciple of Jesus, I can fully embrace the mindset of Christ that it's not about me. I think it starts with us as people, with us as disciples, us as followers of Jesus, recognizing and knowing fully that Jesus lived that lifestyle so that I might be set free. Jesus set that example for me so that I could do that for others. And like Sam talked about last week, it's in that that the world will know that God sent Jesus into the world. If we don't behave that way, if we don't live that way, if we're just a bunch of consumers... Where is this church going to go? Who is this church going to help? How many people are going to come to know Christ in a place where there are a bunch of people who are self-centered? How many people are going to come to know Christ in a place where there are so many people puffed up by pride? I'm not, let me clarify. I'm not saying that about all of us here this morning. I'm asking general questions. Do we understand that? I'm not like trying to bash everybody here. I love y'all. Everybody nod your heads. You know I'm not talking about you, right? No, nobody in here has that kind of attitude. That was facetious. I apologize. Let me, let me back up. I'm not saying that because I feel like that's where we're at here this morning. I'm asking general questions here because I want to get to the heart of If Jesus sets this example for us, we're not above it. We need to, as people, as mature disciples, lean into this lifestyle of understanding that it is not about me. When I come into this place, my desire should be not just that I would consider my own needs. Now, what I love about what Paul says is he says, look not only to your own interests. He does not say, don't look to your own interests. He says, do not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So yes, there are going to be some days where I come in here and I'm, I'm desperately in need of someone to come in and serve me and encourage me and love on me. But man, my focus also needs to be that I come into this place and I'm ready to love, I'm ready to serve, I'm ready to lay down my life. Because this is the example that Jesus set for me. And if we live like this, church, then people will know. The world will know because of the love we have for one another and the sacrifices that we make for one another. I'll say it again. It's not about me. It's not about me. Church, we're about to sing a song. And I love this song. I don't feel like we've sung this song in a long time, have we? We're going to lift up this song. It's a song about our Savior who came and he died. And I hope that this song prepares our minds for communion as we think about the fact that, man, in in light of the sacrifice that Jesus made, Jesus declares it's not about him, even though in the end it was. But he lived that lifestyle for you and me to the point where we can declare hallelujah. What a savior. Let's sing.
Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, who is sinners to I'd like to start with this little story I heard just a couple days ago, and it sort of goes along with what I want to talk about, so it's kind of funny. Seems like this man, he took his family on vacation to the Holy Land, and he took his wife, and he took his children, and he took his mother-in-law, which him and his mother-in-law, they never got along, they always at each other's throat, you know, but he never had no choice in the matter. It wasn't his decision. So while they're over there, just she just passed away. Just all of a sudden, she just died. So he's left with this dilemma, you know, what do I do now? And he's talking to the officials, and they said, well, said, it's okay. It happens from time to time. He says, uh, for $5,000, you can have her shipped back to the States. Or, best of all, for 150 bucks, you can have her buried right here in the Holy Land, and what a great thing that would be. Everybody wants to be buried over here, and it's only 150 bucks. So he thought about it for a couple minutes. Then he said, no, nope, I'm going to pay the $5,000. I'm going to have her shipped back to the States. And the guy goes, well, why would you do that? He said, you know she'd like to be buried here, and it's only 150 bucks. What's your reason? He said, well, I heard this story that a long time ago, you guys buried this guy, and after three days, he came back, and I can't take that chance. <laughs> you know, so. you know um, I have been reading the accounts of the resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what I've come to find out, if you take all those and you just kind of tie them together, you really get a clear picture of what took place. But I think Matthew, above the, uh, above the rest, you know, tells a more complete story. In Matthew 28th chapter, starting at the verse, first verse, he says, After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, 
For the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became as dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and, and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. You know, throughout the history of all mankind, there's never been a more powerful event than the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He accomplished something that no man or no religion ever did. He conquered death. He conquered death, and he still lives today. And throughout history, you know, critics and skeptics have always tried to punch holes in this resurrection story, you know, without success. Because you can go to history itself, and it can prove to you there was a man named Jesus, and he did exactly what he said he, said he was going to do. And the scriptural truths are there. He fulfilled everything the prophecies said about him. He fulfilled all that. You know, and as we look at the death, burial, and resurrection, sometimes we need to do like Paul did when he said, let's take a look what this world would be like and what your state of being would be like if there was no resurrection from the dead. In First. Corinthians, the 15th chapter, starting at the 13th verse, he said, if there is no resurrection from the dead or of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So what he's saying is, you know, there would be no need for Dustin to get up here today. There would be no need for us to be here today, if Christ had not risen from the dead, everything we see before us right now would be brutal, would be useless, would be in vain. He goes on to say in, in the 16th verse, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is brutal. You are still in your sins. Then those who are also fallen asleep, those that have passed on, in Christ are lost. If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. We are to be pitied more than all men. If our faith or our hope is only in this life, only in the things that we can see and hear now, it's amazing and it's true that there's so many people now and always have been that believe after this life that's all there is that you just simply cease to exist. And to me, that's, that's a pretty sad way to think. And I'm just going to read one more passage of Scripture because I want to keep this brief. Uh, in First Peter, the first chapter, the third verse, Peter kind of sums it up like this. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord, from the dead, and into a inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade, kept in heaven for you. That's a pretty good promise right there, you know, that when this life is over, we have this inheritance that's being kept for us in heaven that can never fade nor perish. Because the fact of the matter is, this life is short. It's short. And as a lot of you know, these old bodies are made to wear out. They get old, like Christ said, just like an old garment. But to me, I look at it like an old car, you know. Uh, your parts just start to wear out. They start getting squeaky, and they don't work as well as they used to. But thanks be to God, we're going to get a new body that's incorruptible, that will never perish or never, never wear out. And he said, 
that it's kept in heaven for you. All this inheritance, all these promises are kept in inheritance for you, and it's made possible because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So let's just give thanks for the bread at this time. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and thank you so much for blessing us so abundantly. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and for him giving himself as a living sacrifice for us and giving his body to us to die on that cross. Uh, Father, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We ask that you be with us now as we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our thanks for the cup. Once again, dear God, we just thank you for Jesus. Thank you for, for him going to the cross and shedding his blood, that his blood could be poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. Lord, we thank you so much that, that he was willing to die. We thank you so much, Lord, for the life he lived in the life he gave. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, the leadership here has made it pretty easy for us to give. Um, we don't pass around the plate like we usually do, but there is a box in the back in the fellowship room where you can where you can put your money in or you can do like me I give online because my finances don't come at the same time every month so I just go to alliancecfc.com slash give that makes it easy for me and convenient or else you can get the addresses off of Sam you know to, to send the money here at the building or just a couple houses down the road here on McCallum for Charlie Ray's house, so uh, so please don't forget to, to give. I know our numbers are down and things have been rough, but you know the bills are still the same and the finances and uh, and cost never changes. So please don't forget to give. Thank you. As we uh, sing this last song, uh, you have the opportunity to text Dustin with any uh, prayer requests you may have. Uh, his number again is 814-602-1340. So text him if you have anything that you have not made known already. And let's, uh, let's stand and sing before the closing prayer. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will Will you decide?
decide now to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning again. So we have a few prayer requests before uh, we wrap up today. Uh, the first one, uh, Paula Fontaine uh, wanted to come today. I think Pam was like going to pick her up, uh, but she fell this morning. Uh, so she decided to stay home. We want to pray for Paula that she would recover and, and start to feel better. Um, uh, I got a text from Patty Simmons asking for prayers from Michelle Campbell. Um, she's fighting liver and pancreatic cancer. So we want to pray for her. Um, and we want to continue to pray uh, for the Faust family, the Schweitzer family at the passing of Connie. Um, we want to also continue to pray for Joe. Uh, Joe got to go home on Friday. Uh, if you don't know, Joe had uh, open heart surgery. He had a quintuple bypass on Monday, um, which is insane. Um, so, but he is, he is home now, he's recovering. Um, so we wanna continue to pray for Joe that he would recover. I think he said that the doctor said that he would, should be back to normal in anywhere from three to six months. So we wanna pray for him that that would uh, go well. Um, we also, with it being a holiday weekend, we wanna pray for those traveling. Uh, as you can see, the only rays we have here this morning are Dave and Bev. Uh, the rest of them are gone. So we wanna pray for them and any others that are traveling uh, this weekend for Memorial Day, we want to uh, offer up prayers for them. Okay, I thought someone was... Okay, um, I don't think I have any other prayer requests. Um, I don't think I got any other text messages, so let's pray as we close our service this morning. Father God, you are good. And God, we're thankful for the opportunity that we had to lift you up in praise this morning. Um... God, you are awesome and wonderful and mighty. And God, we are so thankful that you call us your children. God, we're thankful that we have an opportunity to gather as your children to, to give you that honor and glory. Uh, God, as, as we wrap up this morning, I pray that our service was pleasing to you. God, I pray that we would have a constant reminder of the fact that uh, Jesus set an example for us of what it looks like to be true servants. God, that we would live as those that are focused on others and not on ourselves. God, uh, we have a few on our minds that we'd like to pray over this morning. God, we want to lift up Paula to you, um, who took a fall this morning. God, we want to pray that you would give her strength and heal her um, so that she may be able to join us next week, um, that she would start to feel better, she could get up and moving again, uh, that she might be able to be here um, God, I pray that you would just continue to give her strength in all the health issues that she's dealing with. And God, that she might find comfort in the midst of all of those. God, we want to lift up Michelle Campbell to you who is fighting liver and pancreatic cancer. Um, God, we just, we ask that uh, you would watch out over her. God, that you would be with her doctors as they are trying to figure out how to manage this and how to deal with it. And uh, God, that a treatment plan might be put in place that um, defeats cancer. And God, if the treatment plan doesn't work to defeat cancer, we know that you will. We know that you have that power, and we pray, God, that you would be with Michelle in this time. And God, we want to pray uh, continually for the Faust family, for the Schweitzer family at the passing of Connie. God, it's still um, a couple weeks removed. It's still it's something that we just don't get. We don't understand. Um, God, I pray that you would give us comfort, but also, God, that you would shower comfort upon the family as they mourn her passing. Um, God, as has already been talked about and prayed about, we know, though, that uh, in spite of the sorrow, in spite of the mourning, God, we can also rejoice because we know that Connie is home. God, give us peace and comfort in knowing that, uh, that she was once in pain and now she is not experiencing pain. Um, God, she was once dealing with a body that was hurting, and, and now, God, she gets to run. And she gets to walk with you. 
God, I pray that you would continue to be with Joe uh, as he's recovering from his bypass. God, I ask that you would give him strength. I'd be with the family as they help him and tend to him. Um, and God, we ask that you would continue to, to heal Joe uh, so that Joe might be able to join us again soon at full strength. Uh, God, there are, are so many others, um, people that are traveling this weekend. We pray for safety. Um, there are so many others with health issues, so many others who have lost loved ones um, that did not text this morning, that did not offer those prayer requests. And so, God, I ask that you would be present in all of those scenarios and all of those people's lives. And God, that they might feel your presence and feel your love and that they might be comforted by you. As we leave here today, God, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, God, that, um, that those that we come in contact with this week might see something different in us than they have before. God, that we might be people of service, we might be people of love so that the world will know that uh, you sent your son for us. God, may the world know us by our love for one another. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And the whole church said, amen. Love you, church. Have a great week.